Welcome to episode 7 of the Radical Narrative Podcast. I am your host, Mylon Tatusis, coming at you from the prairie, smack dab in the middle of North America. Today on the podcast, I'm sitting down with Jade Levi Roberts. Jade Levi Roberts is currently one of CBC Saskatchewan's Future Under 40 nominees. She is an educator, podcaster, and artist. Listen in as we discuss who Jade is and where she comes from, the background and context for her podcast, Still Here, Still Healing, being a teacher in COVID times, and ultimately we're going to break it down for you and discuss some of the tools we use to launch our podcasts. So stay tuned and listen in. Thanks, Jay, for sitting down with me. I really am excited to podcast with you because you've been at the podcast game for a while, Um, probably for a little over a year now, year and a half, I think. Um, But we're going to get into that. Uh, First things first, uh, tell us about yourself. Yeah. um, So thanks for having me. I'm actually really excited to be uh, on your show. I know we've been kind of back and forth uh, in contact with each other, talking about podcasting things. And and it's really cool that you're bringing me onto your show. So thank you. Um, But yeah, my name is Jade Roberts, and I'm a Woodland Cree woman. My pronouns are she, her. And I grew up in Lac La Ronge, which is in northern Saskatchewan in Treaty 6 territory. I currently... uh, live in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in Treaty 6 territory. And I've been here for about, I want to say eight years now-ish. I moved here and I attended the University of Saskatchewan and got my Bachelor of Education degree in 2018. So I've been teaching for like on and off for three years. I'm was in a full-time position and then I, I took a year off to sub and now I'm in a, a half-time position. Um, and then on top of my teaching gig, I am a podcaster and a digital artist, which is um, a new thing for me that I've gotten into recently. Um, and then I also work part-time for an organization called Taking It Global and they provide telepresence education uh, to communities across Northern Canada. And I'm working for their program called Create to Learn right now that um, they offer digital media skills to Indigenous youth across Turtle Island. And and part of my role with that is I get to work with some creatives from all over Canada and um, I post to social media and run kind of their social media accounts. So, so that's a fun part-time gig that I'm doing right now. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah, you're doing a lot. You're doing a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I am. I'm keeping busy for sure. Um, It's been a little sketchy with the pandemic to like be back, like actually in a school working. But other than that, yeah, keeping busy and and doing some of those other part time gigs from home. Yeah. And I really wanted to position who you are and where you come from in this episode. And and I position myself as coming from Mm -hmm. the prairie in this podcast. And this is where I'm working and doing my work from. But some people did highlight that Saskatchewan isn't all prairie all the time. And where you're from, the landscape is different. It visually and ultimately is different. Um, Yeah, so it is completely different. And that's something that really, um, you know, it was an adjustment when I first moved to Saskatoon, because obviously, like, there's tons of Indigenous people here and they're Cree speakers. um, And... I don't know. It was just, it was very different. It was hard for me to kind of explain to people, especially like the people I attended university with to say like, yeah, I'm, I'm Cree, like from up North and it's way different than here. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, we are Woodland Cree. Um, our dialect of Cree is TH. And then here in, in, uh, the prairies, it's the Y dialect. So when I, I was attending university, I was actually able to, uh, learn a whole lot about, uh, culture and about Cree people and, you know, who I am, but it was from the perspective of, you know, the Plains Cree. And I often like struggle with that, uh, that difference, I guess. There is quite a bit of difference between Plains and, and Woods Cree. Um, but yeah, in terms of landscape, so Lac La Ronge is part of uh, the Precambrian Shield. So if you were to um, take a trip up there, you would see a lot of uh, forested areas and a lot of like exposed rock almost. It's like like cliff type looking landscape um, and a lot of waterways. Uh, so like La Ronge is like a huge lake um, and a lot of our people like, you know, grow up fishing and, and stuff like that. Whereas um, 
here in Saskatoon area, the Plains Cree are like hunters, right? There's not a lot of like waterways to be fishing. So yeah, just like small differences like that. Also, Larange is, it's a unique community. Um, it's known as a tri community. So it has, it's made up of uh, the surrounding reserves, which are part of the La Larange Indian Band. And then there's also the village of Arange and the town of Larange. And they're all kind of combined together. Um so yeah, it's an, it's a unique community to to grow up in, and it's seen as kind of like the hub of the north. Um, it's kind of the last place in the north before there's like not a whole lot else. So you would often see like people from more northern communities, more remote communities, coming into Larange to either buy groceries or go to a doctor's appointment or, or things like that. So it's still a small community, but it's it's. Uh, a busier place in the north. I started to get questions about Saskatchewan from some of our listeners. And, and the assumption with Saskatchewan is that it's flat and there's agriculture mm -hmm. and things like that. And even like the critique of my work is sometimes I forget that there's a whole boreal forest in the north and that yeah. there's kinship ties there. Yeah, it's very different. And I actually, in my first year of teaching, um, so I was teaching Cree language and culture at um, an inner city school here in Saskatoon and, you know, high population of Indigenous kids. And we actually had the opportunity to take them up to La Ronge, uh for the year end camping trip and like to see them just like running around in the forest and like camping and, and having a good time. It was so nice. Like, it warmed my heart to see like, oh, these urban kids like having the opportunity to come out to the bush. And and yeah, it was, it was nice. It was a change for them, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. And it's also interesting, too, because Saskatchewan also has like this urban rural divide, which is very real um, because there are a lot of our people who make their way to the cities and live there. But there's also like a northern southern divide, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure. I think growing up in the North, it's it's a special type of, um, I guess, like kinship or like bond that people in the North have. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, it was different moving to a bigger city and and just having those changes. And there's also a lot of students. I, we, we did look at some of the demographics and some of the students who are at university did say they listen to our podcast. And a lot of them do come from the North to the university mm -hmm. in the South. So I really want to mm -hmm. position that with you, too, as somebody who actually got their teaching degree, went to University of Saskatchewan from the north and is, is doing amazing work. And I want to position and uplift the work you do in that way also. And that's that's something that's cool that uh, people from that have attended university and coming from the north that they're listening to this podcast. It's kind of um, when you grow up in the north, even if you're from a different community, a lot of the time, like everybody everybody knows everybody um, <laughs> coming from those smaller communities. So it was actually when I attended university there, there were a couple people that I was able to connect with. That's like, Oh, you're from Larange. I'm from Bovell or, you know, I'm from Pine house. And it's like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, having that shared experience, I guess. Yeah. So having to find like those support systems that could relate to where you're coming from is really important, especially for undergraduates who are navigating university for the first time. For sure. And then also with the landscape in the north, there are environmental issues up there, too. So there's obviously indigenous lands all around the world and each have their own specific issues with climate change and resource extraction. And there's lots to talk about in regards to Saskatchewan's north. However, is there one key issue you want to concentrate on and have a conversation about? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think this is so important to talk about um, in the north. There's been lots in terms of like uranium mining and deforestation, things like that. But um, currently, there's something going on right now in the Larange area that um, it's been recently brought to my attention. And it's uh, the peat, peat moss mining or peat moss harvesting. And um, there's a lot of people up there right now. It's uh, a very relevant top topic to be discussing. And there's a lot of people up there that are, um, you know, advocating and protesting this peat moss mining. Um, and I recently just started tuning into there's a Facebook group, actually. So I don't like I don't always get to go back home. And I don't have that opportunity to be going up there a lot. Um, so 
a lot of the times I have to get my information through social media or things like that if I want to stay connected to my community. Um, so yeah, I recently tuned in through a Facebook group and I've just been learning a little bit more about what's happening with the peat moss mining. And there's supposed to be a project um, taking place that's going to harvest in four different areas in like L the Larange area. And basically it would just like disrupt the whole ecosystem in those areas. And, and there's a lot of people People, um, that utilize those areas and not only people but um, some of the endangered wildlife up there are utilizing those areas so um, yeah the peat moss mining that's that they're planning to do up there could yeah definitely do a lot of a lot of harm yeah so it's another extractive industry where they're going to be taking the peat moss and sending it elsewhere and probably most likely you know, indigenous people whose lands those are won't necessarily see the economic benefits they should be seeing, but also there'll be a lot of environmental fallout from that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's there's currently a petition a petition that uh, can be signed on their Facebook group. Um, I think it's called for Pete's sake. Uh, if you're looking to check it out, um, but yeah, the other big thing with that, I. I've been doing the research is like, so it's like muskeg area. So it's like a wetland type of area and it acts as a fire break. And there's so many wildfires that happen up north uh, in the summer months. So for this peat moss to be harvested in those areas is going to like take away that fire break, which could be like so harmful if there's any wildfires up in the summertime. For sure. And then of course, with the climate getting hotter, that obviously, mm -hmm. obviously has major impacts in the north with, with the fires that we see every year. And yeah, it's interesting how all these things intersect and there's always fallout. Like it's never just like what you see up front. You always kind of got to look behind and look at how there'll be fallout from some of these decisions. Yeah. And I think they're just like the the company or the corporation that's trying to um, start this project, you know, they always frame it as like, oh, we'll provide jobs for people in the community. And, and it's always been like that, even with like the mining industry and um, the deforestation that that's taking place. Um, it, they always pose it as like, oh, we'll create jobs for you. And it's like, eh, I think we'd just rather like keep our, our territory intact and we'll find some jobs elsewhere. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's really important to highlight, too, is that with those extractive industries, there are always those promise of jobs, but they're also not like the best most. They're not the best jobs in terms of like the moral compass we have with our landscapes and our territories. Mm -hmm, for sure. And there's also food security issues in the north. Um, and that's all a topic that comes up often. We see it in the media. It's a cross Canada issue. Obviously, it gets worse the further north you go, like into the Northwest Territories and things like that. But there's also a follow of that in your region, too, which is um, in northern Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this is a topic, actually, that I haven't really thought a lot about. I remember uh, watching, uh, one of your red talks one year at, uh, what, what conference was that? I can't remember, but I, I listened to one of your red talks and you were talking about, yeah, food security and food sovereignty. And, and that kind of got the wheels turning in my head to, to start thinking about those things. And it's still not something I'm super informed about, but, um, I am hearing more and more stories about Northern communities creating, uh, more sustainable food sources and, and providing for the community members. But growing up in La Ronge, I feel like I wasn't aware of um, a lot of like food sustainability and like thinking I, I know a lot of the times we see like the news articles sharing like oh a jug of milk is like $20 in the north but like that's not happening in Larange and I don't think that's happening there because it is one of those hubs where people that are from even more remote communities come into Larange just to buy their groceries it's a lot cheaper um, so yeah I think the food security is definitely an issue for people in more remote communities and maybe not so much La Ronge, but um, yeah. Yeah. And then at the same time, food security in the sense of like economics and, and, and the delivery of food, but there's also still like a major traditional food access point in the North too, where a lot of you up in the North have access to, to traditional foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's something that's important to me. I, I grew up with a dad and a brother who would uh, provide for us through like fishing. Um, we would always have like moose meat and stuff like that. And, and I relied on them to supply me with those things. And, and now I'm here in the city and I don't 
get those things as often. And um, I don't take the time to learn how to do those things myself. So actually, this summer, I I took a trip up to Larange with my boyfriend who is from Nigeria and he's never fished before. <laughs> so uh, him and I went out on the lake with my family and my brother and, and we all caught our own fish and we took it straight to the shore and, and ate our lunch right there. And it really, that experience made me realize the importance of learning those skills to obtain my own food. And, you know, it gives you that sense of accomplishment and pride to be able to do things like that. So, um, yeah, I guess that's something personally that I, I want to work on and, and be able to do those types of things for myself. Um, the other cool thing recently that's popped up with my, uh, my band where I'm from is they've recently sent out fish packages to every single band member, whether you're living on reserve or off reserve. So, um, yeah, having that, that opportunity to, to give back to the people, and even people like myself living here in the city, I was like so grateful that that they would share um, that fish with with me. So, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, definitely access to traditional foods, fish, and things like that up there. But then also, you highlighted something unique in that a lot of like our generation, the younger generation, even when we do have access to these skills and the, this these access points to you know like traditional food systems, sometimes it's hard to access them because we're doing two things at, at the same time. So like obviously university, right? We spend a big bulk of our time in university when we could be home learning those skills. Um, mm -hmm. How are you navigating that? Because you did say that is something you want to pick up and learn now. For sure. So yeah, I think about my brother who he attended university here in Saskatoon as well. And he always took the time though to to go back home and you know that can be tough uh financially and and even just time not having the time to do that but he did always take that time to go back home and um practice those like traditional ways of uh, getting food and hunting fishing uh camping things like that and i don't know why he had the desire to do that and then there's me on the other hand like no, I'm here in university, like this is what I'm focusing on. And I'm not going to like spend my money going back up north. And, you know, so we had two very different experiences, I guess. And, and he's always had that connection to to the land and, and wanting to be out there all the time, even though he was in university. And then yeah, me on the other hand, like, no, I'm focusing on one thing and, and I don't, I can't make the time. But now, yeah, now I'm out of university and I'm, I'm, realizing the the value of those traditions and and i want to to get back out there more and I, i'm trying to do that yeah for sure and thanks for highlighting that because a lot of university students in particular students who are coming at it from like land-based practices or traditional territories they have a hard time navigating that and i guess like there's really no real answer to that question other than just do the best you can to get through university mm -hmm. do your best you can to access what you can when you can yeah for sure yeah. And then with your university, you do have a, a teaching degree. Uh, you are a teacher. Um, can you tell us a bit about why you chose education as a career path? Yeah. Um, so teaching, it was never my first choice. Uh, my dad was a teacher and my mom also worked in a school. And so growing up, I like never had the desire to work in the same profession as them. And then when I was 18, I, I was still living in Larange, but I was like, I need a change. And I ended up moving to Saskatoon. And the only job that I could get at the time when I first moved was uh, with the Boys and Girls Club. And I was working with a lot of kids and and I didn't think it was really for me but I, I actually really started enjoying it and then there were a couple people I knew who were in ITEP so the Indian Teacher Education Program at the University of Saskatchewan and I decided to check it out and I ended up applying and um, yeah it just it's probably one of the best decisions that I've made in my life to to enter into that program um, I I decided that being a teacher and, and working with youth was really my passion and, and it was a good fit for me. So yeah, I'm still a pretty new teacher. Uh, this is only my third year in and I've 
I've had an unconventional role as well. So um, I work as an art teacher and then as a Cree language and culture teacher at an inner city community school. And it's it's a different role than most like homeroom teachers. You know, I get to teach every grade and um, I'm teaching something that's so important to me. And it's a very flexible position in comparison to people who are homeroom teachers. And yeah, I'm just, I love having the opportunity to, share about my culture and and language and and also art um because these are topics that I'm still ongoing like learning these things it's an ongoing process of learning these things and to be in the role of teaching to young people um it helps me as well so yeah for sure so tell me about a student that touched your heart tell me about a story or something that you have experienced um that changed your life in the field of teaching and education Oh man, there's so many, (laughs) there's so many good stories. I like, I work with such amazing kids and where I work in the city, it's all about relationships with, with those kids. You know, they're not going to trust you if you don't have that relationship with them. They're not going to learn from you if you don't have that relationship with them. So something I've always been good at and something that I make sure to focus on is, is creating those relationships with all of my students. Um, Even if I'm only with them for an hour each day, I I always focus on relationship building. Um, I can't think of any specific stories I'm just like man these are all such good kids and like I just love hanging out with them (laughs) um but I think earlier taking my kids back to La Ronge or up to La Ronge um for their year-end camping trip and just to see like the joy that they had and and for all of us to experience that together and it's just it's a memory that I'll always always cherish and I hope that the students feel that way too you know when you get out of school and you're like oh I had that one really awesome teacher and remember we went on that really fun trip I hope that my students feel that way about that trip because it was it was really special to me and and I hope they they feel the same way they'd be in grade nine grade 10 now some of them um that's probably one of my highlights of teaching so is it a goal for you to be that memorable teacher that takes them out on the land yeah for sure I think about my own experience growing up and I never had um I don't think I've ever had an indigenous a female indigenous teacher growing up in high school or in elementary and so for me to be that person for um some other kid you know that's kind of cool um and another another experience that I'll just bring up this story in my first year of teaching as well. So I work for the Saskatoon Public School Division, and and they're actually doing a pretty good job with bringing in land based teaching and and cultural teaching. And the grade seven and eight students at the time at Pleasant Hill School, we actually got to process a moose hide and create a, a new powwow drum for our school. And that was my first time ever um, processing a moose hide. And so for me to be able to do that with them, it was another really special experience. Um, we got to go out to Brightwater just outside of Saskatoon here and, you know, spend some of our days in the spring um, scraping that moose hide and um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of work. It was, um, a really good experience. And myself and my students actually got to, um, present at a board meeting for the Saskatoon Public School Division and, and just share about that experience and how it all, how it changed all of us. You know, we learned so much just from that one experience. And, and for me to be able to share from my perspective as I'm a teacher and I never had that experience and, for my job to be able to give me something like that. I just, yeah, it was such a good feeling to, to work somewhere that's, that's offering that type of teaching for me. So it wasn't, it wasn't all about the kids either. You know, there's, there's a lot of teachers that are entering new teachers that are entering that never had these teachings either. So for all of us to be a part of that was just, yeah, really amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. We also tend to talk a lot about university and education on this podcast. It was never the goal to position it as like an education university podcast. But the only reason we're doing a lot of these episodes where these questions are coming up is simply because many of our friendships and extended community we have made are through university systems. And we're also in COVID times. So mm-hmm. like we need to, we're podcasting with people we have access to who we can safely access. But yeah, so what was it like attending university for you in general? University just, yeah, I never thought university would be where I would end up. 
like as a young person uh, growing up in Laurent, I didn't see that for myself. I never thought I'd be going to a university. And um, all of a sudden at 19 years old, here I was entering university for the first time. And um, I loved it. I think it had a lot to do with the program I entered into, though. Um, so in ITEP, um, I was surrounded with culture and with people that were like me. And uh, we were able to have content in all of our classes that was, you know, Indigenous content. And, and yeah, it was, I would say, like a life changing experience. And not just because I got my degree, but because of the people I was able to surround myself with. And, you know, I still have those connections with the people I went to school with in ITEP, and I probably will for the rest of my life. And um, yeah, so University was a great experience for me. It was also very busy. Um, so I tried to always take all the opportunities that came my way. And I think at one point I was like on three student councils or something. <laughs> like I was taking five classes and then I also worked two jobs. Um, so yeah, it was so busy. But I think at the time for, for me, that's what I needed. I needed that structure and and um, that busy schedule to, to keep me on track. And and yeah, so univer yeah, university was a great experience for me. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool to hear. And it sounds like you were doing a lot in university too. Um, so that whole characteristic you have of, of, of working and getting things done and putting yourself in places where you could actually do the work, I think is a characteristic that you have. But at the same time in university, a lot of students tend to get bogged down, get to get, tend to get overworked and things like that. How did you navigate that? From what I noticed is that you're also really organized and you stay on task. Yes. <laughs> I'm kind of like... Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit of a control freak. I won't lie. <laughs> I, I do have like three day planners and like a calendar and then there's like my Google calendar. I just, yeah, I'm very organized and, and that's just one of my characteristics. So, um, to take five classes and work two jobs and, and be on all those student councils. It's also like those things fulfilled me. They were things that like I was passionate about. Right. So it wasn't, like it was hard work and it was busy, but they were things that I love doing. So I think that's what kept me on track, um, you know, staying busy and, and doing things that I love. Like the two jobs that I worked, I worked with kids and um, I worked with youth in the inner city. And those are that's what I love doing. So just to go to work, it wasn't it wasn't a big deal to me after taking five classes in a day to go to my job. It was like, ah, this is nice to just chill with, with the youth. And, and yeah, I think that's probably what kept me on track was loving what I do. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense because I'm working with first years this year and like, I'm getting a lot of questions from them and a lot of learning curve around time management and literally making a calendar or a schedule. Um, but they're learning to do that. But then also at the same time, first years, they always have to take the classes they don't want to take per se. So they're always taking like that class they're forced to take because it's part of their requirement or the prerequisite. But then when you get to third and fourth year, you kind of have wiggle room to start to do what you like to do. And it sounds like you did get that stride at that point. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, first year was the same for me. It was like, I didn't get to pick any of those classes. They were ones I, I needed to take. And my first year, I wasn't as involved in with student councils and stuff like that. Um, I was just kind of kind of feeling out the place. I like didn't know what to expect, didn't know very many people yet. And, and that's kind of how my first year went. It was definitely navigating how to um, schedule myself and, and have that time management skill. And then, yeah, getting into my second, third and fourth year of university is when I really started like picking up those student councils and, and being part of the Indigenous community on campus. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, time management is like huge. You need in your first year, I think you really need to get that down. Yeah, you do. I still have my first year binder, my first like two years of college and university binder. And I, and I, I was going to school at the time where I would actually print out the schedule and write it down. <laughs> So it wasn't yeah. like on my phone or anything. I actually had like the physical schedule and we always find it once in a while. And I always laugh because I have even like my gym time scheduled in there, um, <laughs> even my dinner time and things like that. And it, and I just stuck to that schedule all like my first yeah. year and it always adjusted for the next term, but I stuck to it like, like clockwork. 
Yeah. And I think that's something too, is like, we get so attached to our phones and our laptops to keep track of like our appointments and our classes and stuff. Whereas for me, I'm the same way. It's like, you have to write write things down to remember it so that's why I have like I have a day planner that I actually physically write in I keep it in my phone I keep it on my laptop and then I also have like a calendar that I physically write on that stays on my fridge so it's like I have to have all these reminders but I think the most important thing is yeah writing it down and keeping it that way um with university you going to university were there any like aha moments you had in university from a class or a teacher a professor or even a book I don't know if I would call it like an aha moment, but um, I had a class that I really enjoyed and and I always think about. um, So it was anti-oppressive and anti-racist education with Verna St. Denis. Um, And I think that class is what really helped to form my pedagogy for teaching and and how I wanted to move forward as a teacher and and what I hoped for myself and my students. And um, it made me think about how I want to disrupt some of those older teaching practices that are racist or oppressive to um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the education system. And so it's still an ongoing like learning and unlearning for myself. I'm obviously still a pretty new teacher, and I'm I'm navigating. Um, I'm navigating how to be a teacher and and be in this system as an Indigenous person, and um, how to how to have that anti-oppressive and anti-racist pedagogy as a teacher. Um, now that, now that I'm putting it into practice, you know, it's one thing to take a class and, and learn about it, but now to put it into practice. Um, so yeah, Verna's class was probably my aha moment. And if I were to ever get my master's, I would likely consider doing anti-racist and anti-oppressive education. Yeah, that's cool. And that's through USASC Ed Foundations, I think. Yeah, it is. So it's offered here at the U of S. Um, I did think about taking my master's at one point. I applied to the University of Arizona and had conditional acceptance. Um, it was in a different program, though. It was, oh, I can't even remember what it was, something about culture and literacy, uh, which I was really into as well. Um, it didn't work out for me to to go. And then I kind of put my master's on the, on the back, in the background and... Um, and I'm taking a break from from that idea right now. But potentially, I will apply again for my master's. I don't know where or when, but yeah. Yeah, well, that's cool. I mean, it's it's good to take a break. And it's also good to think about getting that master's degree also. And Ed Foundations is an amazing department. I TA for the land-based master's program with Alex Wilson. And they always seem to come up in some of the conversations I have when we're discussing education in general in Saskatchewan. So it's a really amazing program. So jumping back to teaching, you also are actively teaching right now. So you're actually in the school system right now during the times of COVID. How are you noticing teachers, students, and just the overall education system um, dealing with COVID? What's the general feel for life in school right now? Um, (laughs) It's hard to teach during a pandemic. It's hard. Um, I work with students right now from grade two all the way up to grade seven, and I have... I like I said, my role is kind of an unconventional role. I'm not a homeroom teacher. And so I kind of float into three different classrooms during the week. And um, it's been kind of tough on on me because like, it's one thing if you're a homeroom teacher, and you're staying with your same group every day. And it's easier to track like who you're in contact with. As for me, I'm working with about 60 kids a day. So it's a larger group. I do feel like I'm constantly saying like, put your mask on, sanitize your hands, don't pick your nose, you know, things like that. And actually, unfortunately, uh, we have had two cases at our school that just popped up recently. Um, I just got tested yesterday for the first time. And I'm hoping that my results come back negative. Um, But it is it's scary. Like, it makes it real when there's actually a case that pops up that's close to you. Um, But I guess the flip side of that is it's, it's very nice to be back in person with my students. I work with a population that they rely on our doors to be open. Um, So for us to shut down, that would be devastating for a lot of our families. Um, It's a lot more than academics at our school. You know, we, um, they rely on our school sometimes for food or or support in other ways. And I'm just happy that our doors are able to stay open right now. Um, 
But yeah, also keeping in mind that the safety needs to come first. And if we do need to close, then I guess that's what happens and we'll navigate through that. But I think we're doing a pretty decent job right now with what we have. And it's nice to see the kids in person. Yeah. And with the local school here, we shut down early in the term, like students didn't come back, but we had to do a big shift early on to figure out tech and figure out mental health support and figure out some of the logistics we wouldn't need to figure out in a regular school year. So yeah, there's, there is that concern that we have to meet student needs when school closure happens. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. So one of our classes has been asked to stay home. Um, and that's one of the classes that I teach. So they have moved to an online platform. But again, with the community I work in, uh, a lot of our kids don't have access to the tech um, to get online and, and attend the online learning. And so we're trying to navigate like, okay, what does that look like for us? Like, can we even afford to give each family tech? And then the other thing too, is if we were do, to do a full shutdown we have so many families that have big families so if we were to send one laptop home well you can't have one student that's in grade one needing the laptop and then the sister that's in grade eight needing the laptop and then the brother that's in grade four also needing the laptop it's like how do we navigate those things if that were to happen and and i think that's something we're struggling with right now but we are we're trying yeah, and it's an interesting time to be in the field of education in general because I feel like it's going to be a time that we're going to refer back to and be like, yeah, I was an educator or I was working during the pandemic and we had to figure out these things on the fly and navigate them. So it's a really good like learning experience for everybody on how to be flexible and how to do the work on the fly when things change. Any positive stories that are keeping you going through these times in regards to COVID and teaching? Obviously, bad news that just popped up recently. So <laughs> not not the greatest for positive uh, stories. But I will just say that being in person with my students, that's a positive in itself to see the students that are showing up every day that can show up. It's like, wow, these kids are we're, it's the middle of a pandemic and these kids are still showing up to school. They want to be there. And I think that's a positive just seeing them there. And like school is just, that's a huge thing for kids. Like what else are they supposed to do during the day, you know? And especially if they have parents that are working, um, you know, they rely on schools to be open. And and I'm just glad that we are able to be open right now. Um, I don't know if it will stay that way, but I really hope we can figure it out. So jumping back to the beginning of this podcast, we had a conversation about all the things that you do. And you're also a podcaster. You have a successful podcast that is really unique. And it's out there on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, wherever people get their podcasts. But can you tell us about that? So my podcast is called Still Here, Still Healing. And I started it about a year and a half ago. Um, and when I started it, the main focus was to share the stories of residential school survivors and educate listeners about the history and effects of the residential school system. And I had a really great response from the first season. Um, um, I had four survivor stories that were featured and then um, that se that first season ended and I started thinking about what I wanted season two to look like and sound like. And so, um, yeah, going back to the drawing board, I guess, for season two, which is, is currently out now, um, I'm adding episodes. There's one a month that comes out. Um, but I decided I wanted to touch on more topics within the show. So I'm now focusing kind of um, on some inspirational like Indigenous youth stories. I know there's so many Indigenous youth like that are doing great work. Um, and I wanted to highlight that. And then I also wanted to touch on more about uh, intergenerational survivors and share some of those stories. And then the other topic I wanted to bring up this season was um, the 60s scoop i haven't um found anybody yet to come on to my show to talk about the 60s scoop but that's something i would like to have have happen in the future um but yeah that's kind of an overview of what my podcast is yeah and we got some international listeners now who may not be familiar with the residential school system can you explain what residential schools were yeah, so residential schools in Canada, um, they were government and or church run schools um, that First Nations and Inuit children were forced to attend. And the schools took children away from their families and communities for months at a time. They weren't allowed to speak their Indigenous languages or practice their culture or interact with siblings. And they were forced to practice Christianity. And then more often than not, students were physically, emotionally, mentally and sexually abused at the hands of priests, nuns and teachers that were running these schools. 
the first residential school opened its doors, I believe, 1831. And the last one closed its doors in 1996. Um, I was born in 1994. Um, Indigenous people are still experiencing those ongoing intergenerational effects in many aspects of their lives. Um, So our people, our families, our communities, we're trying to heal from these traumatic and and life-altering experiences um, that took place for years and years and years. And um, yeah, I guess that's an overview of what residential schools are. Yeah. And your podcast centers the residential school survivor narrative and allows them to tell their story. Mm -hmm. What inspired that idea to go about it that way? Well, my dad passed away when I was 16 and he was a residential school survivor. And I guess at the time when I was in high school, we didn't learn a whole lot about residential schools, a lot about uh, true Canadian history and things like that. So, um, entering university, I started learning about those things. And, and I always knew that my dad attended a residential school, I didn't necessarily know what that really meant. Um, And so he passed away when I was 16. And then me entering university, I had all these questions. And I was like, I really wish I had my dad to to talk to about these things, and maybe ask him about his experience experiences and and how he was affected but he obviously was not around for me to ask those questions so in my fourth year of university I believe it was I I started thinking about okay how can I get these questions answered for myself how can I I kind of uh, lean into that curiosity and I th- I noticed that podcasting was, um, you know, a big platform that was popular. And I thought, okay, if I start a podcast, this would be what I want to talk about. And um, yeah, the the idea just kind of flowed from there. And it, it turned into a podcast. And here we are. Yeah, and I feel it's something a lot of young Indigenous people could relate to. And they are narratives that we need to hear and acknowledge and listen to. So how has sitting with residential school survivors had an impact on your life? I feel like I've been able to connect with my dad in a way by hearing other people's stories and like maybe empathize with what my dad experienced and um, be able to think about how residential school has affected him. And it's also made me take a closer look at myself. Uh, When I sit down with residential school survivors um, and they're sitting there sharing their story with me and it's, that's an, an act of courage to do that. And I think about my own experiences and and how I want to be able to share my story someday. And and um, unfortunately, there's been, you know, trauma that's been passed down to me. And um, I'm able now to start confronting some of that stuff and take some steps to heal and, you know, go to therapy and stuff like that. I'm I'm learning and and unlearning things. And when I'm able to sit down with residential school survivors like they're courage and their bravery is um, inspiring. It's inspiring to me. And I think that's a huge impact on my life. I also thought like the title of my show was called Still Here, Still Healing. And I really took a look at myself um, about midway through my first season. I, I took a look at myself and I thought, well, how can I be sharing these people's stories and and not doing the healing work myself. And so I started thinking about the importance of 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 doing that work and how young people even need to do the work now. And and yeah, I guess that's that's how it's impacted me personally. Yeah, that's really cool to hear. And this approach seems to be working because your podcast is accessible and it is working to get an audience that can hear these narratives and begin to reflect on how residential school has impacted our family systems from multiple perspectives. And how does this tie into your role and your responsibility and your ultimately your career as an educator and teacher? As a teacher, it's my job to educate. um, And this topic especially is important to me. Um, I feel like it's information that that needs to be shared with our young people and we need to share that true history and they need to learn about it and I know that there's many adults in Canada who are still like unaware of residential schools and the impacts and so I wanted to be able to share these real stories and and provide um, some education from my perspective uh, yeah as a resource I guess. What I really liked about your podcast and, and what how you position the work is that it's our people telling our story. And it's not necessarily coming at it from, you know, putting people on a stage to 
um, tell their story so that a white audience can listen per se. Not saying that your your audience is all indigenous. There's ideally there are non native listeners, but you're really giving like autonomy to people through the podcast platform because they could tell their story on their terms. Yeah, and I think that's a huge thing for podcasting is like it's accessible for us to be able to tell our own stories and. Um, yeah, when I speak to like, I get to talk to students from across Canada with my job with taking it global. And oftentimes, I'm sharing about podcasting and how I got started. And that's something I share with them is podcasting allows us to structure that narrative that like benefits us. It's not being told from like a big news corporation. Our stories are being told by us because we have this access to podcasting. And I think that's so important. Yeah, I agree. Because like for our generation, when you look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we didn't get to sit in on some of that stuff. Like we didn't get to hear the narratives. And I know they're really private stories and sometimes they're really traumatic. But for me as a person navigating the world today, a young indigenous person, I didn't get to hear the stories. Like I didn't get to hear what actually took place um, in those schools and how they impacted my immediate family members, my uncles, my aunties and my grandparents. And that's unfortunate because I think it's a big part of who we are and we don't get to access them. And they were told in a very like politicized legal way with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And some of those narratives aren't going to go beyond that. They aren't going to be told beyond that. And of course, I understand that this is private for a lot of people and a lot of families. But this podcast that you have does provide an avenue for some of us in the younger generation to hear what took place in those schools. So for me, it was also a learning experience to hear old people and residential school survivors tell these stories in that way. Mm -hmm. And that's something um, I try to, you know, I'm, they're trusting me with sharing the story with me. Like they don't have to share with me. They, you know, they could say no to me when I approach them. Um, and so to have that trust, I always make sure that I'm, I'm taking care of their stories. Um, and I try to present it in the best way possible uh, through this platform. And I, yeah, I agree with you is that these stories have become like politicized because of they would have to retell in a, in a court. And that's like, yeah, this, there's no humanity there, right? You're re-traumatizing somebody um, by doing it that way. And so, yeah, that's something that's important to me is is taking care of people's stories. Um, it's trust and and I feel honored every time a survivor is open to sharing with me and with whoever else is listening. What is one thing that happened as a result of this project or this podcast that you didn't expect? I guess like I could share the, the things that have happened for me personally is like I've kind of become known as, you know, this person who podcasts and it's open doors for me. I've been able to or I've been asked to host on different different podcasts. Um, so that's been a cool experience for me. Um, I've also been nominated for a Canadian podcast award, uh, which was a big deal and and exciting. I never thought that would happen. Um, and I really have to say, like, I know this might sound cheesy, but it's like, it's all because of the listeners and like, thank you to my fans. <laughs> Just kidding. <Yeah. laughs> but <laughs> um, no, it really is because of the listeners um, that I got this momentum going. Um, when I first started out, I didn't expect much. I didn't expect a whole lot of listeners. And then all of a sudden, I was like on the front page of the Apple podcast. And I was like, whoa, this is sweet. Like, thank you guys so much for seeing the value in these stories that I'm sharing, because I see the value. That's why I started this podcast. And I just that's what I want others to do as well as like, listen to these stories, educate yourself and, and see the value. So is there an episode that is most memorable for you? I'll just say one of the memorable ones for me was, um, his name is Frank. So it was Frank's story on season one. And um, he is from my home community. He knew my dad. He knew me since I was a young person. Um, and he's just a, a really awesome guy. He's full of positivity, full of resilience. Um, and he actually works in our community uh, with people with addictions and their families. And so his story always amazes me because he shares like the raw truth of what happened to him and what he experienced. And, you know, it's awful, but he is the type of person who just like, he's created such a, a beautiful life for himself and, 
and he's he's not afraid to share uh, what he's been through with others because he knows it will help other people. And so that that episode stuck with me. Um, it was one of the first ones that I ever recorded. And then I guess just recently, the one I just launched today was with my friend Regan Ratmispanas and his mom. And um, yeah, he, he also gave you a little shout out on there, Mylan. Um, okay. <laughs> he, this was a great one that will always stick with me because his mom actually attended residential school with my dad. And, you know, it really made me think, this is why I started this podcast was because of my dad and for her to share some stories about him and her relationship with him. It just, I never was able to get that from my dad because he passed when I was so young and I've always been like longing for that conversation with him and for her to provide some of that for me. It just, it was personal and it'll stick with me. It was a good, it's a good episode. Yeah. That's amazing to hear. And that's, I guess that's another thing with residential school stories and, and narratives is that they're very personal for our people because it's our family. They're our family, right? And and it's it, it's our gener- – it, like you said, you know, the last residential sco- school closed in 96. You were two years old. So this isn't like something that happened 200 mm-hmm, years ago. This sure. is like right now stuff that we're processing in real time. Yeah. Um, what is the one key understanding you would like people to take away from your podcast and this overall project? Uh, well, I think it's like right in the title. So still here, still healing. Um, I That's what I want people to know is like, we are, we are still here, still healing, but also like we're still thriving, still loving, learning. And I just want people to educate themselves about the true history. And I, I keep saying true history because, you know, we've been fed a lot of uh, Western and colonized history and and we need to take a look at the true history and to know that, you know, yes, Indigenous people have, we've had a rough past and it's because of colonization. And I just want people to know that we're not going anywhere. Um, you know, there's been some disgusting assimilation tactics, but we'll always be here. And I think we're only getting stronger as we continue to heal. And that's that's where the title comes from. And that's what I want people to understand. Yeah, it's a really strong and powerful podcast. I'm really glad it's out there and doing the work that it's doing. And there's been a wave of podcasts for the, like in the past few months. And it's really great to see. And we have been getting DMs and requests from people asking how to start a podcast. And we're always glad to help Indigenous people start a podcast. So what advice do you have for people who want to start a new podcast? So I can relate to that as well as like I, I had a lot of people reaching out to me asking like, how do I do this? Or um, how can I start? And what do I need? And stuff like that. So I'm glad you're asking this question because I know there's lots of people out there who um, are curious about starting their own show and I want people to know that it's accessible it's it's easy to access it's quite easy to get started Um, and like I said I often speak with groups of young people from across Canada about my podcast and and just podcasting in general and um, I always give that advice is that it's accessible and there's not a whole lot of barriers to get into it you don't need the most expensive equipment Um, you can get started with you know a really low budget if you needed to and I always say that uh So yeah, there's not a whole lot of barriers to get into it. Um, A lot of the times it's free. So like getting onto Apple and getting onto Spotify, um, some of those big platforms, it's, it's free. So that's not a huge barrier. And I think that's something that maybe scares some people is like, oh, how like I can't get my show onto Apple. That's like big, big time stuff. But like, really, it's not. And then yeah, it's, uh, it's a new form of storytelling that I I really think we should be utilizing. And and like you said, having that uh, chance to to share our own stories from our own perspective. I always tell the youth as well that like they have a voice and we all have stories to share. If you just find a topic that's interesting and, and just run with it, you can start a show. It's it's simple. And there are people like me and, and you, Mylan, who are there to help if somebody ever wants to reach out. Like I, my DMs are always open. And also we just we live in a world where education is right at our fingertips. So you can legit just Google how to anything. And <laughs> that's how I started. I, I just opened up Google and was like, how to start a podcast. So do the research and and take some initiative and and stick with it i think that's that's my advice 
Yeah, for sure. We even shot you some questions too early on uh, when we were sort of coming together to figure out how we're going to do radical narrative. And yeah, you responded, you were supportive and and here we are today. Mm -hmm, For sure. And then also like one interesting thing too, is that the style of your podcast and radical narrative is that we're doing like the audio podcasts. We're doing the ones that show up on the RSS feed. And I had a nephew who was just surprised to see me on Apple podcasts. (laughs) And like you said, it was an easy process because you could do it through a app that will distribute it. And yeah, but he was really like super impressed and amazed that I was on Apple Podcasts, but it wasn't that big of a deal. It was actually pretty seamless to to get our podcast out there and on that platform. But yeah, it's open to people because I know there's a lot of webcasts that are getting started now. And I noticed that some people are intimidated with the camera and that whole live type approach. But with Radical Narrative, we do go through some. But with Radical Narrative, we do go through some edits and it does take, you know, a few hours, not much, but we do edit it up. So I agree. Um, I'm someone who's not comfortable being on the camera. Um, so I don't think I would like really, I know there's some podcasters who end up uh, turning their shows into like YouTube channels. Um, I don't think that would be a route that I would ever take just because yes, I, I'm the same way as you. Like I do a lot of edits. Um, not, not every episode gets a lot of editing, but for the most part I do, I do quite a bit of editing on each episode. Um, And that's something that I'm kind of self-taught in. So I I maybe don't always do the best job, but um, yeah, editing and doing the audio RSS feed is more of more of the route that I chose to take. And it's been working for me. I don't think uh, a webcast or a YouTube channel or anything like that would be anything that I would pursue. Yeah, we're, we're exploring the option. Like there's three of us involved in Radical Narrative. And we're exploring the option for YouTube, but it's just like a time commitment that we don't have because this podcast is, it's a hobby. It's like a side gig. It's not our primary work because we all have jobs. We're all grad students and things like that. So we only dedicate like a few hours a week on it. And we come together and bounce ideas off each other and text back and forth because we're all from like different parts of North America. Um, But yeah, people can start a team where they do that kind of style. And everything's online for us, so we could access it remotely from wherever we are, mostly for most of the stuff we do. And yeah, it's all audio. It's all RSS feed where we just upload it to a website and it distributes it out to all the podcast platforms. So with your process, because I know you said you're only doing one episode a month, that's your process and your project and podcasts are flexible like that. Um, how, How much time do you dedicate to an episode? Um, it depends for the most part. Yeah. So I do one episode a month for this season. I just find that's what works for me because I'm back to teaching and I have my other job that I work as well. Um, so yeah, it's a hobby for me too. I I don't get paid for this. I I do it because I want to do it. And, um, it's something of interest to me and there is quite a bit of time that can go into an episode. So I usually spend the month, I would start by finding someone I want to interview. Um, And that can sometimes be hard, you know, finding somebody. Um, So I find someone I want to interview, we schedule a time for to meet. Uh, Lately, it's been over zoom. Um, And the recording usually takes about an hour. And then from there, I edit and sometimes like last night, I edited the episode that just came out, but it's a two part episode because we recorded for like two hours. Um, And that took me about three or four hours worth of editing. Um, And that was that's that's one that's like time consuming, but they're not all that long. Um, And then, yeah, I just I release and kind of try to promote on my social media. So I would say for the month, maybe about 10 hours to get one episode out. And that, that's also including your style of where you have to schedule the interview and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like, I know there's some people that also they do all their recording at one time for their season, and then they'll just like edit it all and then release like one every week or one every month. Um, so some people do it that way. That just doesn't work out for me to be doing a bunch of recording for like, like two months, and then release that way yeah i don't i don't think that would work for me and that that's the cool thing about podcasting is yeah it is flexible if you want it to be flexible like you get to decide there's nobody telling you what when and where and how to do it yeah and for us we just upload an episode when it's done we didn't commit to like weekly episodes or anything like that and our episodes are kind of long we heard that people like to listen to them in two sittings so we take that into consideration and we didn't really dedicate like to a timeline we just go with what we can do and once it's done it's done 
And then also with your technology, because I get a lot of technology questions in our DMs is like, what are you recording on and things like that? And I do upload some photos onto my personal Instagram of our equipment. It's really not about the equipment. It's about the content. So do you have any thoughts on equipment or procuring equipment for somebody who wants to start a podcast? Yeah. So again, like accessibility, I this is what I say to the youth, like you can record if you have something to record your voice, it can literally be an iPad or a cell phone or a laptop. It doesn't have to be fancy. But if you do want to drop some money and like get real with podcasting and like take some time, you can find mics for pretty cheap that just plug into your laptop. So those are like the USB mics. Mm -hmm. And that's what I started my show with. I paid, I actually received a grant, so I didn't pay for it. It was sponsored, um, but it was $150 for the mic that I had. And it was just, a, it's called an MV5 Sure USB microphone. And I just plugged it into my MacBook and I took it with me to all of my recording sessions and just, you know, flipped open my MacBook and recorded uh, right from that that little mic. And then from there, I moved up to using a Zoom and an Audio Technica mic. So that's a little bit more on the expensive end. Um, it was, again, something that was uh, given to me through uh, my work. And it's actually, it's not mine to keep. I'm, I'm using it for now because I work on on another podcast through work. Um, so yeah, the Zoom would be kind of a step up from your USB mic. And then right now, I'm even a step further from that. And I'm using um, my Audio Technica mic again, like it's it's a pretty good mic um, with the Rodecaster Pro. So it plugs right into my the Rodecaster. Um, and then you can plug in your cell phone, you can even do Bluetooth with your cell phone, you can plug it into your laptop. And um, yeah, all sort, you can do all sorts of things with this Roadcaster, but it is expensive. So I'm just thankful that it was kind of gifted to me to use for the time being. And that's about it for tech stuff. I feel like it's very accessible to get started. That's like my main takeaway. Yeah, and just using what you have available to you to get your content uploaded to those websites that will distribute that podcast. We just started with Basics too, and we recorded some pilots with you know basic equipment and software we had, and then we expanded and developed as time went on. And as we saved a bit of money and yeah, I just decided to invest it into some more equipment over time for sure. And then I know some people who are just going to be starting with their um, iPhone um, mic jacks and do some audio stuff. I think like Michael Moore's podcast rumble, he was just recording on his phone for a while. It wasn't the best. And I think he finally got a production team involved, but his first like few podcasts came out just with him recording on his yeah. And see, that's what I tell the kids, like, because they're obviously not going to have access to things like a roadcaster and things like that. So I'm like, if you have a pair of headphones that plug into an iPhone or an iPad, like there's a little mic on there that will do the job if you that if that's all you have. Yeah. And I think people could edit on iPhones and some of the phones out there, the smartphones with uh, GarageBand and things like that. And that's free on iPhones. And I know a lot of people out there have iPads, so it's free for iPads, too. I was going to ask you, what it, did I ask you this already? What do you use to edit? Uh, we use Hindenburg Journalist Pro. Oh, yeah, yeah. But complete disclaimer, um, it is kind of pricey and we did have to invest in it. And with COVID times, we're doing a lot of our recording distance like this one over the phone and things like that. And there's software that you could use that will um, help you edit and things like that. Like for our levels, we use Autophonic. That was introduced to me by Sam Sanobi from Southpaw Podcast when I went onto their podcast and did an episode. And I think you get two free hours of their software a month. So if someone's doing a one a month podcast, you have two hours of free soft uh, noise reduction and things like that, that you could use through that platform. So there's softwares out there. You just got to find them. And I think I did tell you about Autophonic. Yeah, I used it on my recent episode and I liked it. So thank you for that. Cool. It worked good. Yeah. 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 It just yeah. It smooths it out and, and removes some of those things that we tend to forget about with our editing process. But I mean, it, it, yeah, like, I mean, software is a thing too. I mean, I know there's apps on iPhones. I know Anchor, people could record to Anchor um, directly. And I just tell people to look at Anchor app because it is accessible. We use Anchor. It distributes our podcast for us and it has a lot of cool little episodes on how to start a podcast on there. So check it out. Mm hmm. I yeah. And I mentioned this to you before as I thought about switching over to anchor. But um, yeah, the other thing is I for software, if anybody cares about this, um, <laughs> I use GarageBand on a MacBook. 
And it's only because I started, like, when I was really young, I had an Apple computer at home, and I was able to kind of get familiar with the uh, user interface and just um, play around with it a little bit. So when I started my podcast, I was like, oh, I, I know how to use GarageBand, like, but I really didn't. I just like I I had to learn quite a bit still. But GarageBand is pretty easy to navigate. There's lots of YouTube videos to kind of teach yourself. Um, and then the other cool thing about GarageBand, um, I also do a workshop on this with some kids um, if they have access to iPads. Um, there's GarageBand available on an iPad as well. It's a little bit different than the desktop one, but you can record right there on an iPad as well. Yeah, and there is some learning curve to a lot of the software and a lot of the equipment. Um, in my undergrad, I went to an art school, so we had to learn how to use Macs and use the Mac interface for various softwares and audio recording and visual recording. And I took an oral history class that kind of showed us how to do the mic setup and the audio recording setup. So, I mean, I did have some training, but for the most part, a lot of it is self-taught with the new software and things like that. And some of the best podcasts out there don't necessarily have the best equipment. And a lot of the stuff they're doing is online through online interface now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where can people find you and your podcast online? Um, so a couple different places um, for to find my podcast still here, still healing. You can find it at shshpodcast.podbean.com. I'm also on Apple and Spotify. If you just search it. Um, also, People can support me by donating or purchasing some of my artwork on Coffee, which is ko-fi slash Jade Roberts. And all the funds from um, any of the, those donations or people purchasing my artwork, they go directly back into my podcast or other related projects. And then my personal account where I post a lot about um, updates for the podcast is on Instagram at Jade R with three R's 94. And I'll link those all up in the show notes so people could find you. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sitting down with me, Jade. I really appreciate it. And I enjoy hearing about not only what you're doing and where you come from, but more importantly, um, the message behind your podcast, Still Here, Still Healing. And yeah, we have been getting a lot of questions about how to start a podcast. And I thought, yeah, it'd be great to sit down with another Indigenous podcaster and just lay things out 100% for people to pick up on and utilize too. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm happy that uh, you had me on. I, I appreciate it that you thought of me and, and thought that what I have to share is important. So uh, thank you. Yeah, for sure. So stay in touch and thanks for everything. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Bye. This episode was produced and mixed by Mylan Tatusis with additional production support by Daryl Lucero and Peyton Jackson. If you like what we do, please like, subscribe, and share. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at The Radical Narrative Podcast. If you wish to contact